Welcome to Just Energy Radio with your host, naturopath and medical intuitive, Dr. Reed Louise. We have learned from Einstein's theory that matter and energy are one. Physicists believe that all systems in nature have their own particular way of vibrating, from the swinging of a pendulum to the waves of the ocean to the light that brightens the sky each day. Each of these oscillates at its own unique rate. The same holds true for every thought, feeling, event, or word we speak. Each has its own frequency or rate of vibration. What many of us don't realize is when we take everything in our universe down to its simplest form, it is all just energy. Join Dr. Rita Louise on a journey through time and space where past, present, and future collide. Today, what you believe may be called into question. What we want to know is... Who made up the rules? Be brave and step outside the box. We are about to turn our world upside down and venture into the unknown. Hold on. We are departing our own beliefs and entering alternative realms. Enjoy the possibilities. Hello and welcome to Just Energy Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Rita Louise, and welcome to the show today. Oh. Yet another amazing episode. We have my good friend, Dr. Amit Goswami, coming on to talk about quantum economics. How exciting. Um, Just Energy Radio is brought to you by soulhealer.com, where you can find out about all the products and services I offer, including medical intuition evaluations, energy healings, and psychic readings. So if there's stuff going on in your life, give me a call, send me an email, and we can set up a time for a private consultation. It's also brought to you by the Institute of Applied Energetics. That's www.appliedenergeticsinstitute.com, where you can jumpstart your intuition today by downloading their free 50-page guide, appliedenergeticsinstitute.com. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Admit Goswami, and we're going to get him on the air and find out all about economics, quantum style. Amit Goswami is the author of the highly successful textbook, Quantum Mechanics. His two-volume textbook for non-scientists, The Physics uh, Physics View of Nature, traces the decline and rediscovery of the concept of God within science. Goswami has also written eight popular books based on his research on quantum physics and consciousness. In his seminal book, The Self-Aware Universe, he solved the quantum measurement problem, elucidating the famous observer effect while paving the path to a new paradigm of science based on the primacy of consciousness. He calls himself a quantum activist. He has appeared in the film, What the Bleep Do We Know? His new book is called Quantum Economics. His webpage is amitgoswami.org. Please welcome Dr. Amit Goswami. Hi, Amit. It is so wonderful to have you back on the show. Hi, Rita. Good good to be back. You know, your people sent me an email and wanted to know if I'd be interested in having you on the show. I was like, of course. Thank you so much for being so kind to me. Well, I love having you on because we always have these very hearty, deep conversations that... um, That is true. Yes. Um... So let's see. So today we're going to be talking about quantum economics. And to me, you're a consciousness, subtle energy guy. So why economics? Well, that is the that is the point that even surprised me. You know, all this happened because of a synchronicity. Um, I had a conference with Dalai Lama in 1999, where he he encouraged uh, the 30 or so scientists and visionaries to uh, apply our new paradigm, developing new paradigm to social problems. So that impressed me. And I did a little bit of that, um, wrote a book called Quantum Doctor. But imagine my surprise when um, in 2005, I got a call from President of World Business Academy, uh, Rinaldo Gutoko, who wanted me to join the academy as a fellow. But of course, I said, I know nothing about economics. That's one subject I've never studied, never had a course. And he says, no, no, you have a good uh, worldview. So you must bring the impact of that worldview to economics. So that's how it all started. (laughs) <laughs> I wrote a couple of papers, but then uh, it was still slow going. It just got finished last year. So, 
you know, it has been a long time. But I think I think um, I think the product has been good. It 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 does. I'm happy to say that quantum economics is a natural extension of uh, Adam Smith's capitalism, and not an unnatural. Um, uh, modifications that scientific materialism has done to it, which has given us more disasters than the original version. But this new version will finally produce a complete rendition of what capitalism can be. And uh, this is why we call it quantum economics, because just like Newtonian physics was not complete without the idea of possibilities and potentialities, um, that quantum physics brings. Similarly, um, uh, Adam Smith, capitalism is not complete without the idea of subtle energies, uh, science of experience that uh, quantum physics within consciousness brings us to. Who is Adam Smith? <laughs> well, of course, <laughs> he is the, he is the uh, uh, earth-shaking personality who gave us the basic idea of capitalism in an unsuspected book called The Wealth of Nations. That was in the 18th century. So uh, he really gets, uh, you know, gets us going. And you can see the success. You know, this revolutionized um, economics, revolutionized our uh, society. Most of the countries today are uh, following still capitalism, although not meaning the same thing in every country. Some countries, like in Europe, it's more like socialism because they have put in a lot of social good, which uh, the original version of Adam Smith capitalism leaves uh, in, implicit, not explicit. We have brought in some social good through uh, what is called Keynesian economics, but not enough. So quantum economics, again, another way of thinking of it is that it really brings in a lot of uh, social good through the concept of um, this higher satisfaction of higher needs, higher experiences that developed countries are quite ready for. When you live in America and you live in Europe and all these developed economies, you know, the material stuff uh, doesn't satisfy anymore. You take it for granted, and, and you should. That is what a developed economy means. So we are hungry for satisfying our hard need, higher needs, our vital energy needs that we feel, our mental needs, uh, meaningful tasks, meaningful jobs, and of course even value needs, spiritual values. We, we need spirituality in our life more and more. And we are not getting it from uh, scientific materialism-oriented economics that we live today. Are you suggesting that we're moving further up Maslow scale of hierarchy, that we're looking to move out of a materialistic world, or we would maybe be happier if we move out of that into a higher mental realm kind of thing, spiritual realm? Wonderful. So that's the, that's the, that's the question that uh, turned me on to. See, I, I'm not only in Algobotoko, I also knew about Maslow's work. And, and that happened because uh, I was um, on a radio show uh, back in the 80s, I think, uh, maybe even earlier, with a business uh, professor at the University of Oregon, where I worked. And this uh, businessman brings about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and we talk about it. So it made an impression that, um, you know, uh, businesses even then, well, at least some business uh, people, I mean, this is a professor of business, not exactly a businessman, but still um, they're thinking about something as esoteric as mental meanings and spiritual values. That made an impression on me. Of course, as a physicist too, I'm sure he was equally surprised that a physicist was thinking of our consciousness. <laughs> So uh, we both got along just fine, and uh, that that idea remained in my mind. So when I was back doing, uh, picking up the inspiration from Rinaldo, um, I immediately thought of Maslow, and uh, I must say that uh, that the basic idea of putting uh, these needs into the economic equation uh, also came from Maslow. Maslow was helpful. Well, I, and I, I, I agree. Um, is that why you think capitalism isn't working? Because 
we're not getting our needs met? Uh, well, that's not the primary reason. Capitalism is not working primarily because the material dimension is finite. It's finite and we cannot keep on infinite expansion, um, infinitely expanding economy on a finite resource. That's the, that's the main reason. Um, of course, social good, we are not putting that in. That's also a main reason. And Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if we satisfy these needs through economics, that will also bring economics to fulfilling social good. So it, it serves it serves both purposes. The uh, subtle energies are infinite, so it serves to fill in the gap that materials can never fill. Material economy will always be finite, but we need infinitely expand, expanding economy. Um, so in, 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 in this way, the quantum economics that I'm suggesting um, is a solution to all the problems with uh, Adam Smith capitalism. It, it even solves, I have shown in the book, that it solves the boom and bust cycle. The one stubborn problem with Adam Smith, whichever version we have picked, even with the demand side, even with supply side, even with monetary economics, uh, all the materialist stuff of uh, consumer uh, interest and um, getting out of the recession through consumerism, nothing has worked to, to really solve the um, boom and bust cycle. But including subtle energy in the equation of economics does it. But I think we're getting to a point where how many cell phones can you possibly need? How many flat screen TVs? I mean, you know, granted, they, they build them to break, you know, and so you have to replace them every few years because they break. But I don't need a new TV every year. Yeah, right. And, and for TV, we definitely don't need it. But have you noticed that they make <laughs> computers and, and cell phones in such a way that every now and then they will the old old stuff, all, all machine will just not be able to handle the new machines, which some people will buy, and therefore they build the pressure, oh, you have to buy the new one, because otherwise you will not keep up keeping up with other people. Uh, of course, consumers have to get together and they have to agree that nobody buys the new machine because the old machine is adequate. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it, it makes me think of like the Blu-ray DVD players. I don't have one and I don't think people are jumping on that bandwagon, even though that technology is there. Even though I think the media, you know, they're they're trying to push it because then they'll get to the point that they'll say, oh, well, we're not going to make regular DVDs anymore. We're only going to make Blu-rays. And so right. if you don't have a Blu-ray player, yeah. you're SOL. We need a consumer, a consumer revolution, consumer revolt to get over these ways that they handle um, but this also leads to wastage of material resources, completely unnecessary. Instead, we need to uh, cut short technologies which have reached the saturation point of people's use. Sure, the experts and uh, people who need much, much more computing power, they can have all the recent stuff. But ordinary people just do not need so much uh, computing power in their cell phone, and now even watches. Of course, I don't think not too many any, too many people will buy those watches because they're so costly. So, but you know, this is the madness: um, information processing. And what we need instead in the developing uh, developed economies is meaning processing. People are ready for going back to mind, going back to meaning, going back to their soul, going back to spiritual values. And this is all because the material needs are basically been uh, satisfied in the developed countries. So we are ready to move on. And, and the uh, short-sightedness of the econo economist is what is keeping us from moving on. Quantum economics is filling the gap. But, you know, you can't uh, charge people, you know, meditation by the hour. Uh, so I think they have I think they have problems with that. Yeah, yeah, we have to we have to uh, change some mindset. We have to recognize that meditation teachers and Tai Chi teachers they bring happiness to us, they bring vital energies to us, and therefore they do need to be paid, and uh, that will start a new labor force that starts the new economy. And the idea is very simple: people who give us happiness, 
people who give us um, vital energy, people who give us mental meaning, they are um, helping us. They are as, uh, as much helping us as people who give us cell phones and people who give us computers, uh, de desktops and laptops. And so, you know, we have to start honoring the production of uh, the subtle, just as we have to learn to consume the subtle, because then the intermediary of material is gone, and that would only produce good, because the material consumption cannot be sustained. So if we cut short on the material consumption and go gung-ho on the subtle energy consumption, then we will get sustainability as a new world. Okay. Not that we would be harmed as a species to not have all of this technology. I mean, we don't need to have internet. We don't need to have TV. You know, there, we don't need to have it. Um, but if we stop investing energy into uh, material goods, what about the evolution of, I'm going to say, technology? I mean, do we, do we even need to keep going down that road of developing more and more technology, or can we just take that energy and focus it somewhere else? Well, that's the thing. We, uh, we don't have to give up entirely on things. You know, Internet, I think, overall is here to stay. So, you know, I'm very careful about not dreaming of things of getting rid of something that is already in place and which is potentially a good thing. Although, you know, Internet is mainly used for pornographers and pornography lovers, but still, <laughs> has, really, it's true. But, That's uh, why I love you, Ahmed. You just call <laughs> it like you see it. Well, it is like that. Uh, but, but it has potentiality. It has potentiality to connect Connect us. You know, it is an amazing thing that, you know, even if um, you were in Texas here and I'm in Oregon, but even if you were here and I was in India, even then we could keep on Skype, although the time difference, uh, frankly, makes it quite difficult even then. But the remote places on Earth is connected through uh, Skype, through Internet. So this is something not to be thrown away. This is precious. Um, in quantum terms, uh, we need these local connections to access the non-local oneness that we all have. Um, so uh, this local connection is a very good thing, because otherwise the non-local connection only remains potentiality. It never is actualized. To actualize my non-local connection with you, I got to make connections like this where I am talking to you on Skype and looking at your picture. That makes me, makes me directly correlated with you. So we have a relationship, and that's important. If, if all people of the earth, more and more people start having local relationships, um, getting into a non-local relationship becomes much easier. And that is wholeness, that's spirituality, and that's important eventually for the success of quantum economics, success for making people happy, making people more loving, making violence go away and stuff like that, which you need, which you badly need. What do you mean by non-local relationship? Yes, good. I'm glad you asked that. I have a habit of throwing out jargon without explaining it. Okay, so local requires signal. Non-local is signal-less communication. Local communication, like we are using electro electromagnetic signals for communicating, non-local uh, does not need any signals to communicate. So it's instantaneous, and it works because we have an oneness underneath. We are both connected through non-local consciousness, our consciousness at a very deep level. We usually um, call this consciousness unconscious, but that is a misnomer in a way. It has stuck, so we are stuck with the name. But this unconscious that Freud first introduced and Jung further developed, that unconscious quantum physics now takes to a much bigger proportion. It is the reservoir of all potentialities that we have, and that is the non-local reality. Through it, any person who is correlated to another person through local can communicate whenever they are um, ready, whenever they can access. There is some learning to do here, but we can learn how to access, how to communicate through non-local channels. 
And uh, it is quite wonderful. Only thing is that you cannot predict and control this channel. You have to learn some ways to access it, and but you can never control it. You can never be sure that you have non-local connection. It has to be in consonance with the movement of consciousness. So every social system have to remember this this other criterion that we thought um, we we really thought it's something else because when Adam Smith was talking about invisible hands of the free market. He certainly was not thinking about movement of consciousness, but that's what it is. There is a constraint on everything. If, if things that humans do are in consonance with movement of consciousness, then it goes easier because the non-local connections work and keep things in uh, ship shape. But if, on the other hand, we go against the movement of consciousness, as we are doing now with the incomplete philosophy of scientific materialism and with terrorism, with bigotry of religious kind, um, we are really, really violating the movement of consciousness and look at the world. We, we are talking about drought and rain in Texas and summertime and these uh, ungodly temperatures in Delhi where people are dying. Uh, on the other hand, snow wet places in May. This is just ridiculous. And we are getting it all because of the uh, tendency that we have developed going against the movement of consciousness. Well, and it sounds like when you talk about this non-local relationship, and I'm just going to throw out a very kind of simplistic term to represent all of this, but kind of like a telepathic communication or telepathic connection to one another and the world around us. Would that be a correct assessment, simplistically right. speaking? Absolutely. Completely correct uh, assertion. And, and, and more. It, it's, it's not just telepathy. Now um, we can have creative ideas together. So we both ponder a problem uh, that's affecting both of us. We both prepare about it. And then um, uh, even though we are sitting in different places, our local communications like this will be helped through non-local communication that will go on, and that will enhance the chance of creating, getting a creative breakthrough for either one of us. So uh, scientific collaboration, artistic collaboration, any kind of collaboration, cooperation between doctors, you know, sometimes uh, we are um, we need expertise from a person who is millions of um, thousands of miles away. Um, how do we get it? Um, today we need local uh, transports to get people to the place needed. But now with uh, non-local channels open and more and more our ability to access it, we can get such expertise together. Uh, both locally and non-locally, much better in a creative venture. You know, healing is kind of creative. There's a creative element in healing, which is often ignored when we think only in terms of scientific materialism. So, yeah, telepathy-like, but much more general, much more um, conducive to solving problems. Uh, now that we are getting access, getting full understanding of what goes on in telepathy. And is this kind of like the idea of if you have multiple people together focusing on an item, it creates an energy behind it so that it can move forward better, easier, stronger, and, and potentially manifest into the world or impact the physical world? Yes, I mean, you've got the right idea. The, like, uh, it's, revolution, it's going to revolutionize uh, businesses, because what businesses used to call brainstorming, now can be done at a much more profound level. Brainstorming, basically, the originally conceived was the idea that, you know, people have um, uh, opinions, strong opinions about things, but they are afraid to voice it because they will be ridiculed. Uh, so the idea of brainstorming that, okay, everybody gives judgment under suspension, we won't ridicule you, that's the promise, you can say anything you like. Um, but that wasn't enough. It wasn't very successful. Even though we do that, we just weren't very successful because people were not listening to each other and they were not giving 
their unconscious a chance to intervene. See, at the conscious level, processing is good, processing is important. We call it preparation in creativity, but it's not enough. We also have to allow the unconscious to process that which we prepare. And it is the unconscious which multiplies the possibilities to enormous extent, and then consciousness can choose the new possibilities that will solve the problem. So uh, quantum physics and quantum worldview suggest a new way of doing brainstorming. And this too is part of how we change the businesses today with quantum economics. Um, we allow people to allow time in between their responding to somebody's opinion. In that time, unconscious takes over, the collective unconscious, everybody's consciousness together, and possibilities proliferate. And then the chance that you'll have a creative idea when you respond is much greater. And this is what businesses have to learn. Well, you know, and I was wondering how the quantum physics fit into all of this, but it's starting to unfold. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's quite beautiful. You know, my, my, my friend, uh, Dr. Jim Alvino, and I have established a quantum economics business coaching a new uh, organization which will be uh, um, connected with quantum activism movement, of course. And um, we are going to take this door to door to businesses that look, we have some new stuff to teach you and um, quantum economics, the new paradigm to um, uh, give us the uh, umbrella for all these new ideas. And if you learn these new techniques, you will join the 20th, uh, 21st century um, business properly in the proper way, because 21st century business has to uh, go beyond materialist economics. You're just not working for them. So in, in, in what ways, like, you know, I'll give you an example of how subtle economics might work, uh, will work. Take the case of oranges and common coal. Now, everybody knows, and research um, confirms that, that if you have a cold, you take oranges, you uh, feel better. It really does relieve some of the symptoms of common cold, oranges, they do. So Linus Pauling, who was a great scientist who recently died, um, uh, Nobel laureate and all, so he got the idea that it must be the vitamin C in oranges. And for a while, you remember, vitamin C was the big hoopla of, you know, how it creates, uh, cures common cold, but of course, uh, people didn't really get much help, except for, of course, that's a little bit of placebo effect. So for some people, it seemed to work for a while. But when they took surveys and when they took clinical studies, um, the relationship just was not there. Vitamin C does not cure common cold. So what was wrong? Oranges do, but vitamin C doesn't. But you cannot eat too many oranges because, you know, then you will get fat and too much sugar, of course, is not good for anybody. So what to do? And this is where the idea of vital energy comes in. The healing power of oranges for common coal comes from the vital energies associated with the macro shape of the oranges, the macro functions of the oranges. So it's at the macro level. When you take molecules of vitamin C out of the oranges, the vital energies are left out. Now, we have a technology now for uh, using which we can take the vital energy of, of the or oranges at the same time as we take out the molecules and then put back in into the molecules when we sell the molecules. So we call this vital, vitalized, vitalized vitamin C. And this vitalized vitamin C, my prediction is, will cure common cold. And so, you know, this is the kind of technology, vitalized water, vitalized rice. You know, we, everybody is suffering from Monsanto rice. We don't even know that Monsanto rice, because it's genetically modified, does not have the vital energies that ordinary rice gives us. And that vital energy is as important as the carbohydrate and um, little protein that rice has. So um, uh, what do we do? Well, we reject Monsanto rice. We go back to the original rice, but the original rice also has a problem because it is now grown in such a way, you know, organic rice is one thing, but uh, 
rice that we get from supermarkets, uh, cheap rice would not be organic. There would be rice grown with chemicals and stuff that also uh, not does not modify, genetically modify. Just the forms are the same, but the forms will be contaminated, not as pure to maintain the correlation of the vital energies. So here also we revitalize food items that are processed, grown with processed chemicals, chemical processing or preservatives that are added. In these cases, we can we can put the vital energies back in and then the food will become better. So in this way, uh, there's enormous scope. Uh, billions and billions of dollar new industries can be um, uh, developed uh, using the vital energy concept, using the vital energy technology. And that's the part that I don't understand. You know, when we talk about... Um capitalism and consumer economics, you know, it's about uh, demand and, you know, meeting the, the needs. And to me, to everyone that I know, um, you know, they, they want to eat good, wholesome food. And when you go to the supermarket, you think you're getting things that are good for you. And But that's not what's being made. That's not what's being marketed. And then when you start getting into things like the GMOs, it's like they're they're bringing them in the back door. So you go and you get an orange and you think you're getting it. You know, it's an orange. It should be healthy. And then you find out that there are all these chemicals or preservatives or well, not preservatives, but, you know, insecticides or it might be a GMO. And it's like, but that's not what we want. Right, right. And this is a peculiar situation where ignorance, instead of being bliss, is really harming us. Ignorance because we don't know about vitality. We just don't realize that why we get fat with supermarket food. You cannot get fat with organic food. It's really true. Why we get fat with supermarket food is that we eat too much because it does not satisfy. It does not satisfy because it's not giving us the vital energy that should be giving us, that it should be giving us, that organic food would have given us. So, you know, of course, people who can afford organic food, I suggest we'll go back to organic food right now. But, of course, many of us just cannot afford. There is no question. Organic food right now is not plenty available. The scarcity keeps the price high. But as we realize that, look, we got to get back to as much we can to organic food, then first of all, the price of organic food will come down. But as I said, the revitalizing technology will save even ordinary food because ordinary food will then be vitalized, will get the vital energy from ordinary supermarket bought food, and then it will satisfy. And so this obesity problem that is happening in America, just a rampant, this obesity problem, the real solution, of course, you know, I, I like Larry Clinton's idea to keep the, I mean, not Larry Clinton, sorry, um, Mrs. Obama's idea of keeping the soft drinks out of children's hand. But um, uh, but the point is that that's only a small portion of it. It's the whole food industry that needs to be vitalized. And uh, as soon as you vitalize it, uh, I, I, I predict that the obesity problem will be solved because we won't feel like eating um, eating too much. You go to countries um, like India, where um, these preservatives, etc., are not used that much. Uh, what you get um, is coming from the farms directly, and you get some access, although there are two. Monsanto is a huge problem. It's genetically modified. This idea is catching up, so you have to be careful. But if you don't get the gen- genetically modified stuff, but things that are coming from the farm, you have more access to farm products, organic products in places like India. And you see right away, in India, you can all eat all you wish and you don't get fat because it does not have the problem of um, this vital energy has not been stripped off. And so uh, it satisfies, you, you, can eat, you can eat lesser quantities. Um, so you are feeling that you are eating all you want but actually you are eating lesser quantities because you are satisfied sooner. But they're also not eating McDonald's or they're not eating, you know, Domino's pizza or, you know, I mean, you go to the supermarket and 
Okay, so I'm I'm dating myself here, but I remember in college where I, we could go down to the farmer's market and for, you know, $10, come home with two giant bags of groceries. And now you go into the supermarket because the farmer's markets are, depending on where you live, you may or may not have one. Um, but even when you go into the stup- supermarket, it seems like the produce section keeps getting smaller so that they can incorporate more prepackaged, pre-made stuff that they want people to buy which they never get my money yeah well it 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 makes things worse and we we are also so we need some consumer education but the education will come i mean that is of course a a problem i admit that the biggest problem for um uh, installing the new economics will be the education of not only the business people the producers the investors but also the consumers themselves. But several things will help, which is that the worldview will change. And as the worldview changes, people will um, not only want to get meaningful jobs, which already is happening, but also will realize that we don't need to overeat, we don't need to overbuy consumer goods in order to be happy. This um, needing to be quick happy uh, this is what gets us into places like McDonald's and pizzas and so forth. That quick idea of quick happiness. But there, there is direct access to happiness without going through this material intermediary. That worldview has just been lost. We used to have that worldview. You know, worldviews affect people uh, slowly, but uh, the effect is definitely very devastating because you grew up with that idea, you know. Uh, There is evidence um, that suggests that between age two and seven, uh, we just imitate people. We just imitate the people who are growing up. So if our parents like um, hamburgers and pizzas, then we just just catch on to that. We cannot help it. We are too vulnerable. We are almost like uh, hypnotized uh, little kids, just following our children, uh, following our parents blindly. So uh, that being the case, you know, how um, important it will be to um, re-educate the uh, culture, entire culture. But once we do that, then the cultural conditioning will automatically change the next generation because kids pick up what the parents do blindly, as I said, in a hypnotized way. So uh, changes can come pretty fast. Worldview has to change, however. So that's the that's the uh, trick. But worldview has to change because quantum physics is compulsory. Um, people have tried to overturn quantum physics for almost a hundred years. Uh, nothing doing. Quantum physics is here to stay, and uh, make no mistake about it. So what is quantum worldview saying? Quantum worldview is saying that scientific materialism, the idea that matter moves in space and time, one domain of reality, is just simply wrong. There is this other domain of reality, domain of potentiality. Objects are possibilities, and consciousness chooses out of the possibility the event of our experience. In other words, whatever we experience, including the material world, is comes through the intermediary of consciousness. There is nothing that is substantial in the world without the intervention of consciousness. Consciousness does matter. Consciousness does the world. Consciousness does experiences. So this idea, sooner or later, it's going to take over because it's just true. It, it's, it's experimentally verified and it's being verified day to day by better and better experiments. When the worldview changes, you will see that this kind of consumer education will not be as daunting as it seems now. How do you think these changes will affect the political environment? Will they have to be transformed as well? The, the political environment is uh, is a story that's the that's the next thing, next 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 um, book for me. For me, it, it is <laughs> really very seriously quantum politics. Um, I'm, I'm beginning to write now with an Australian guy named Will Hamilton. And uh, this is this is a very important thing because um, what is happening with politics is, uh, you know, uh, democracy works because we elect representative 
who then will empower us and lift us up. Uh, this is the whole idea of democracy. Democracy is is complete antidote to what was before feudalism. There was complete elitism. The upper echelon of the society, which are few, they control and they uh, basically act as dictators, set the policies, set the society for the numerous serfs that follow the lead of these barons, the leaders. This used to be the case of feudalism, but we got over it. We got over it in the 18th century. We got three good ideas, capitalistic economics and democracy and liberal education. Now we are talking about democracy and there the idea is that although people are not empowered right now, but if political power is given to representative who will then use their power to empower the people through education, through economics, capitalism, then people will be empowered, such empowered people will go up in status and eventually the elitism will be completely gone via the creation of the middle class. Middle class will be the uh, will be will be making the leaders, political leaders as well as economic leaders and so forth. And the mobility is called the American dream. Everybody who works hard enough will get to go there. But this is now completely gone. As you have um, noticed in the press, there is some recognition of elitism and people are, have started paying lip service to elitism, but they're not really doing anything, neither the Democrats nor the Republicans, except some notable exception like Senator Elizabeth Warren, you know, whom I respect very much. But really, uh, you know, even Obama, who is sort of in between, but still basically an elitist. Um, so what do we go from there? And, you know, it's a very important point. Elitism got to go because it's not consonant with democracy or democracy got to go. If we choose democracy got to go, it will be total chaos. You have no idea, you know, live under dictators. That's the alternative, really, as you are finding out in the Middle East. Dictators were gone. It was total chaos because they're not ready for democracy. We are having democracy for so many hundred years. To give that up in favor of feudalism and dictatorship is unthinkable. So obviously you have to find a remedy. And the remedy is, of course, Back to the idea of Jeffersonian democracy, where the leaders will work to empower people, ordinary people. And that's how democracy works. Ordinary people got to participate. They don't participate anymore. In this country, 50% of the people don't vote. What is participation? It hardly exists. And that's why the Republican Party, which is the party of the feudalism, the religious feudalism uh, philosophy, they continue to hold so much power. If we have people empowered so that people participate, so that people vote, we'll drive the rascals out in no time and start a new democracy of the Jeffersonian type where political leaders will indeed, will not keep the power for themselves, but will distribute the power, empower people, and things will become democratic again. Yeah, education is crucial for both quantum economics and quantum politics. Do you think that by bringing in this new paradigm, it will help lo uh, level out the playing field where people of any class, any background, any race, color, creed, whatever, will be able to have a say, participate, and and move forward into some of these areas? Absolutely, absolutely. As we begin to empower people, we'll see unprecedented human potential being satisfied, especially in the developed economies first, but it will catch on to an extent, um, to some extent, very quickly. So the underdeveloped economies will follow uh, quick enough. So in, in a century or two, we'll see completely a new, uh, new world. Uh, how far, you know, we are stuck with this good, evil battle uh, mythology right now. Uh, so, you know, it's very hard for some people to imagine a world of good without so much evil. 
but but it will happen. It, that's it. That's a trend. I mean, that's it. That trend we can see. You know, Europe has not had a worse uh, since when? You know, since the end of World War Two. I mean, that's just amazing. For seventy years, uh, Europe was constantly fighting, constantly battling. Has not had a major battle, major war, and there's a little bit of um, Bosnia, but you know, quite minor. Uh, so, um, of course, we have problems with Middle East, and uh, those problems are um, really quite difficult problems. But the solution uh, can be pointed out. Solution is one and only. We have to remove this uh, absolutely incomplete worldview of scientific materialism. We got to remove the bigoted, uh, dogma, dogmatic, uh, fundamentalist religious hold on people. And those two can be integrated in the quantum worldview, and then we get a uh, social uh, system such as quantum economics and quantum politics and quantum education that will uh, finally get us, uh, get us set in the proper road to proper human evolution, where human potentials will be fulfilled, like the American dream says that it should be. What role, if any, will money play into this whole thing? Uh, you know, as we're talking, and I read your book, you know, what kept jumping into my mind, and sorry for my connection here, um, was in on Star Trek, for example, and this is where I'm going. On Star Trek, they had no money. They had evolved past the need for money. Do you think that that's something that will happen on the on this planet at some time in the future? Well, it, it may, you know, everything is possible. So I, I never say, in quantum physics, you never say no to hardly anything. <laughs> because <laughs> of those well, half-day cap possibilities, I know. <laughs> but I, I think that really, I mean, you know, I know right now because money has caused so much imbalance in the society because, you know, that has become sort of a demigod to so many people that very serious-minded, very intelligent economists are suggesting that we give up the money idea altogether. But I don't subscribe to that, because um, if we uh, take quantum economics, then what happens is that the money can be employed to buy things that are good to us, good for us, like love and happiness. You know, it, it's, uh, the idea is so simple. I mean, you produce a person who is um, mentally and, and and soulfully situated. But what that means is that this person has access to real uh, wholeness. And that wholeness is so real that if you sit in the proximity of such a person, you will start feeling happy. This is the breakthrough. So all we need is to learn how to produce such people of wholeness. And we have now the technology, we have the understanding of quantum creativity, which can do it in a hurry. So uh, we can really produce um, uh, ways, human capital, which can be used to directly, directly sell people happiness and love. When money can be used to buy happiness and love, not following the old dictum, money cannot buy love, defying the old dictum, in fact, when money can be used for buying good stuff, not just pleasureful stuff. Today, we buy, we get money, and we we buy it with, with you know things that gives us temporary pleasure, like good clothes and hamburgers and so forth. But then it are always followed by pain. If you eat too many hamburgers, you get fat. Uh, clothes, they're lying in the closet because you don't like them after a while. They saturate. This is the problem with pleasure. It, it does not last. Whereas happiness, on the other hand, it lasts. You start going to the company of these um, sages. In India, we call them satsang. When you are having the company of sages, you are in satsang. And this satsang will start changing you. And you will gradually lose the attraction towards pleasure, which is temporary, instead will become attracted to happiness, which is permanent. It changes you permanently. You become more happy, more positive. There's already a 
uh, branch of psychology called positive psychology, which is coming in vogue, and they, they make the same point. Negativity is evil. Positivity, on the other hand, is good. So um, as we choose the good, society itself becomes modified, okay, and, and therefore um, uh, these kind of problems will be just not non-existent. Well, and if you look at the world today, it's like our focus is really on the negative. All you have to do is turn the TV on or pick up a newspaper. Everything is focused on the negative. Yeah, and we have a natural tendency to that. You know, we cannot blame people because we have, uh, we really do have, sociobiologists are not completely wrong. We really do have the brain wired for negative emotions. We call it negative emotional brain circuits. So this has been a huge problem. And of course, this is why so, so many violent episodes in human history, they all come from these negative emotional brain circuits, you know, Genghis Khan and the cruelty of the ancient Roman Empire and all these, you know, World War II, Hitler, all of this is the subject of negative emotional brain circuits. We can go on and on. Or in ordinary people's life, they manifest as the simple attraction to sex and violence. So we watch uh, sex and violent movies and we watch pornography on the internet and all this stuff that goes on. We cannot help it. The circuits are there in the brain. What human being is, of course, is not just the brain and what is already in the brain. Human beings also have consciousness and the subtle worlds. And this is the subtle world that we are gradually learning to use. And as we are learning more and more and more and more, and now with the quantum worldview in place, we are learning with absolute certainty that there is a subtle world of archetypes from which our intuitions come. These intuitions bring us positive emotions. When you have an intuition of love, if you follow it through and cultivate it, you will start feeling that your heart, that's called in the Eastern tradition, it's called the heart chakra, that your heart will feel open. It's more open to accepting people. It's more open to love people. And uh, this is what happens when you become sensitive to your intuition. That balances the tendency to be negative. So it's, 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 it's not a process with which we are unfamiliar. Of course, we know so many people, including our grandmothers and our aunts, you know, mother and father, of course, and, you know, they are so loving, at least to their children. How does that happen? Because when you become a parent, when you become a grandparent, you are a little bit more tuned towards loving to at least to your children, to your grandchildren. And then we hear the, you hear these intuitions. So there are two negative emotions are there, but you can balance it with the positive emotions that come to us via intuitions. There are, of course, bad parents, and there are, of course, um, evil grandmothers, but, but that's, not, not, that's not very common at all because um, we have that much of wisdom already. And this wisdom we can pursue with quantum economics uh, wonderfully because as people learn to consume love and happiness, as people learn to consume better vital energies, positive emotions, then they also become uh, emotionally more intelligent. That would be good. Um, do you think we are finally relearning things that our ancestors knew thousands of years ago? Because, you know, we're talk you're talking about the chakras and you're talking about vital energy and subtle energy, which are talked about in the Puranas in a number of different texts that, you know, that come out of India and other uh, spiritual traditions. And so are, have we lost that? Have we lost that knowledge in ourselves because of this whole capitalistic model? Well, what happened is more complex than just that. Of course, there is a grain of truth in what you're saying. But um, if we remember the complexity of it, you know, the, um, in the uh, modern, when modernism came about um, back in the 16th century, you have to notice what the world was. 
the technology of modern warfare came to the Westerners first, uh, to Europeans, and the Europeans um, developed uh, Eurocentrism. They are the center of the world, basically, and they colonized the rest of the world, more or less. And so uh, that, unfortunately, denigrated all the wisdom that was contained in the other parts of the world and uh, limited us to only the European part of the wisdom. And that was unfortunate. The European part of the wisdom was saddled with popular Christianity. And popular Christianity has never carried the message of great masters like Jesus, although um, there are always exceptions. And Christianity has its own revolt. The Protestantism grew out of um, the original Christians. But they didn't do much better because it was head-centered. The, the heart uh, was not in the picture in the way that Christianity dominated the West. This was the basic problem. The heart was abandoned. Women, of course, um, uh, carries much more heart energy than men, traditionally, in all cultures. And uh, women were denigrated in the West, um, uh, very much so, of course, uh, not as much as some of the other, uh, like Islamic cultures, but still uh, denigrated to the extent that the heart never really recovered. And so um, what we are seeing now with the advent of uh, Eurocentrism going away with the coming of um, the East into America and Europe, uh, colonialism falling apart, uh, all these things have helped us to reunite the East and West, and so the heart is coming back in a major way. And just at that time, movement of consciousness producing a unification of science and spirituality, a scientific integration of science and spirituality, that again, you know, the brain, role of the brain, the head is obvious. Nobody has to teach you that. But the role of the heart is subtle. And people will have to learn that. But once we learn it, it's so wonderful. It's so wonderful to, get, to be able to love somebody. It's so wonderful to be able to care for somebody. But you have to wake up to it. You have to, you have to do it. You have to, you have to believe that it, it can be done. And the belief comes from the prevalent science. Right now, the prevalent science is scientific materialism. It, the heart doesn't exist. Only head only rational thinking, because head is just a computer. But when that gives away to quantum worldview, then consciousness comes back with all these subtle energies, and then we have positive as well as negative emotions. We have, we have uh, feelings as well as thinking, and the heart comes back. Excellent. I'm looking at the clock, and we need to take a quick break, OK? okay. We'll, we'll come back on the other side. I'm Dr. Rita Louise. We're here talking to Dr. Amit Goswami about his book, Quantum Economics. His webpage is amitgoswami.org. And we'll be back after these words from our sponsors. Just Energy Radio with your host, Dr. Rita Louise, will return right after these messages. Listening to IRN, the Inception Radio Network, Chicago, Illinois. Illinois. Are you looking for a cure for boredom? Never worry. IRN's new interactive website introduces a number of ways to pass time while you listen to your favorite show. Choose anything from the IRN Chat Lounge, the Game Lounge, the Video Lounge, or the Mood Lounge. These fun, exciting features let you chat in real time with fellow listeners, view live sky watches, play daily posted online games, or pick a show based on topic. The choices are endless. Use your time wisely, keeping it all on IRN. Who were the gods of antiquity? They've been described as the forces of nature, levels of consciousness, and aspects of our psyche. Stories that depict their incredible weapons, their flying machines, and their amazing adventures are characterized as being the product of our ancestors' fanciful imaginations. But what if the tales of the gods are true? 
Did the writers, chroniclers, and scribes of our distant past actually document a realistic view of our origin? My latest book, Man Made, The Chronicles of Our Extraterrestrial Gods, looks at our most ancient legends. Learn of the torrid romances, elaborate plots, violent scandals, and conspiracies that played out in antiquity. Find out the role the gods played in the life and culture we have today. If you want to find out the truth of who we are and where we come from, order your copy of Man Made today. For more information, go to www.manmadethechronicles.com. That's www.manmadethechronicles.com. Hello, Inception Radio Network listeners. This is Amanda. Remember, you can take your Inception Radio shows on the go. Just download the Inception Radio Network app for your iPhone, iPad, or Android smartphones and access live shows, past shows, guest lineups, and much more. Just visit the iTunes Store or the Google Play Marketplace and download it today for free. crossroads in your life and discover alternative solutions to your deepest concerns at SoHealer.com. So whether it's a physical problem, an emotional issue, a question about work, or troubles in your relationships, naturopath and medical intuitive Dr. Rita Louise can help bring peace, harmony, and health back into your life. Schedule a session today. Visit SoulHealer.com right away and live the life you've been dreaming of. You didn't forget what's coming up tonight, did you? Hi, Inception Radio Network listeners. This is Amanda. Never miss that interview you were looking forward to or the show on your favorite topic. Follow IRN on Twitter, I underscore, R underscore N, and get reminders about the evening's live shows as well as fun and important updates throughout the week. That's I underscore, R underscore N, and never miss a great show again. We only have a couple of seconds before we have to get back to the show, and I want to tell you how you can jumpstart your intuition today. Using my free 50-page introductory guide filled with simple, revolutionary, and proven techniques, you can ignite your intuition and tap into your inner wisdom all from the comfort of your own home. The Institute of Applied Energetics is the leader in online home study instruction for those interested in becoming a certified medical intuitive, intuitive counselor, or energy medicine practitioner. Now is the time to transform your life and take it to a completely new level. Discover who you are and how you work. Open the door to the world of intuition, health, and healing. You can jumpstart your intuition right away by going to www.appliedenergeticsinstitute.com and downloading our free guide. Get the opportunity of a lifetime and live the life you deserve. Download your free Jumpstart Your Intuition guide today at www.appliedenergeticsinstitute.com and begin living a life filled with passion and purpose. Computer? Is your internet connection down? Don't worry. Use your trusty cell phone or landline and call into our listen line at 401 283 6700 to listen to the Inception Radio Network 24 7. Again, that call in number is 401 283 6700. For the Inception Radio Network, I am MJ. Go deep inside yourself and venture into the realm of the unconscious mind with my Meditating on the Kabbalah Guided Imagery Audio CDs. Discover who you are and what you want in life. Meditating on the Kabbalah can help you to open, clear, and revitalize the energetic pathways of your subtle being. They will support you in your spiritual quest by helping you to access the profound insights and inner guidance you need as you work in alignment with your highest good. Let them help you to release negative thoughts and emotions and clear away any limitations that may be keeping you from experiencing your full potential. Walk down the path to health, healing, understanding, and enlightenment with Meditating on the Kabbalah. Order your copy today at www.soulhealer.com. That's right, that's www.soulhealer.com. Hello, Inception Radio Network. 
Would you like your favorite show to be played again live on air? Well, now the choice is in your hands. With IRN's live request portal, an easy way to request your favorite show with a simple click. IRN's live request portal now gives you exclusive access to all the shows. How easy is it? Simply type a show name or a guest name, click request, even write a dedication message, and that's it. Try it now. Simply visit InceptionRadioNetwork.com, click on the live request tab under the show menu. Now playing your favorite show is just a mouse click away. And now back to Just Energy Radio with Dr. Rita Louise. Hello and welcome back to Just Energy Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Rita Louise, and thank you all for staying tuned to the second hour of the show. We've been here talking to Dr. Amit As. Swami about his book Quantum Economics: Unleashing the Power of Economics of Consciousness of an Economics. All right, hang on a second. Unleashing the Power of an Economics of Consciousness. That's a little bit of a tongue twister. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 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 uh, his website is amitkaswami.org. Amit, I'm going to change our focus here a little bit from what we were talking about in the first hour. And let's spend a little bit of time talking about upward causation, which I love talking about this concept. Um, how can a shift in our consciousness help to create economic change? Okay, this is this is very very important. How to how a shift to uh, shift in consciousness can produce economic change? Well, uh, the first of all, you know, human mind reacts much better to crisis. So it's a good thing to talk about economic change right now because we just are coming out of a crisis. And when we know um, what didn't work and we are doubting, definitely we are doubting more when we are in the thick of the recession. Now we are doubting less. Already economists are, have forgotten that they have said just a few years ago, three, four years ago, that current economics is not working. We really need major modifications, but now nobody is speaking like that. Okay, so that's human nature. But we are aware, ordinary people are aware that we have a field which even has Nobel Prizes now, but it's really an empty field. There is just no basic um, anything that people can know with guarantee, with any kind of force of truth in it. Uh, basically, economics is in a situation where Adam Smith did some very good work and subsequently um, Keynes added to it. And that's what I call classical economics. And then just emptiness, emptiness and emptiness, false ideas, like we can make economics mathematical. Lots of verbal price, but no product that will ever last. Because simply because human nature is not machine, humans are not machine. And therefore, you cannot predict behavior of humans by mathematics. It should be pretty obvious. I mean, uh, the upward causation model just doesn't work because, you know, that way elementary particles govern us. But everyone who has anything to do with economics knows that those consumers, they're stubborn human beings. However much you say that, well, I know the key to consumer behavior, I have the mathematical equations of consumer behavior, I have the game theory, and I have Nobel winners in this mathematics, however much you propound all this, still the consumer will not agree with you. You can make bubbles, you can think, you know, for a while you can get things going as if things are working like you predicted, But eventually the bubble bursts. And why does the bubble burst? Because the consumer is a human being. It's not a machine. You could not predict the behavior of a human being so completely. And this is the reason that we will have a change in economics, economic change, and people will accept that we cannot be sidestepped by this material influx of ideas like mathematical economics, we cannot go on destroying capitalism by having this financial alternative of financial banking, investment in financial banking. That is a little bit of elucidation, so I'll go into it uh, if you want me to. 
But um, the production consumption economy is the one that ordinary people are involved with. And that just has to recognize that we are human beings. We have experiences other than material experiences, experiences of the subtle. We have those needs. And if we develop an economics which can figure out how to use those needs in a suitable way in economics to run our economy, then that's the economy that will embrace. So in that way, economic change, I can readily see, will come fairly quickly. Of course, the powers that be, establishment will uh, try to resist. But I think that the problem of recession is now so severe, we are getting recession every two, three years, and we are really not even getting a proper recovery. We really never have recovered in the true sense of recovery from the Great Recession as of yet. Europe is already under recession again. America will probably within a couple, three years will be again under recession. So if this is the situation, something got to give. And uh, the worldview change and all this is simultaneously taking place again. Something got to give. In the world of science, something got to give. So everywhere, uh, change is coming. How quickly is the only question. So, you know, this is why uh, I have set up quantum activism. We have to be activists and actively propound the quantum worldview that integrates, that does not have all these problems that scientific materialism has brought to us. In recent years, there have been a number of I'm going to say like young entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs who have gone and created something, you know, and I'll, I'll just, you know, like Google or YouTube or, you know, some thing um, doesn't have to be a computer thing and have turned them into big companies, you know, very successful. Do you think that, um, where a lot of this change will come will be from individuals who are dissatisfied with the current work model, you know, where you go and you work for somebody else and, you know, on an assembly line somewhere and they look to create something from themselves, you know, because that brings them happiness. Do you think that that will kind of spur on this new model of economics? Absolutely. You bet. What we what we'll have uh, very soon is that somebody will become aware that there is a scope of making billions of dollars, big bottom line profit by investing in vital energy technology. This is the new one. Mental energy, we really mental meaning we really already employ to some extent. You know, books, uh, videos, movies. They're all uh, in some ways. Uh, representations of mental meaning, although it does not, it has moved away from the potentiality of using mental meaning in the fullness. So lots of change has to come in those fields too. But it is the vital energy field that is new, that is attractive, that is revolutionary, and that is tremendously money making. We discussed food industry before, but take take another industry, home industry, housing industry, which is really a major one. You know, um, all recessions, you know, it stops when the housing starts building again. And that's not kidding. That's really true. Housing is major for human beings. We all need shelter. Now the question is how to make the house better to live. If you have ever lived in a new house, you would know that a new house is not uh, very livable. It's very strange. You know, it's new. It's wonderful. Paint smell is gone, so you cannot blame it to something as gross as uh, smell of paint. That's not the issue. Or you can get the lawn uh, okayed by the uh, people who sold it. So, you know, uh, the, the, all this stuff can be done. But still, when you move into a brand new house, you're, you, won't feel, you won't feel that you are very happy here. You're a bit uneasy. And then after a while you have lived there, then it becomes okay. It's very strange. This is the reason that people don't get rest in hotel rooms, because in hotel rooms also, likewise, you know, people are, uh, different people are coming and different people are living. So it, it does not produce the kind of rest. Why is that? This is because whenever you are somewhere, 
the place become associated with your vital energy, correlated with your vital energy. And it keeps some of that vital energy imprint even when you leave. So in hotels, this vital energy is always changing and your own energy just is not there. It takes a while and one night is just not enough. In a house, it's interesting because you will stay there and therefore the energy will gradually become comfortable to you. But suppose we sell houses in a different way. We have this human capital of greatly loving people, happy people, and every house, before you sell them, you invite one of these persons to inhabit the house for about a uh, few weeks to a month or a few months. And then you sell the house. Imagine the you move in and immediately the house, instead of being slightly uneasy for you, is actually the opposite. It's even better vital energy than you have. So it's actually giving you loving energy, giving you happy energy. So in this way, housing industry, when we understand the concept of vital energy and learn to use it properly, will just uh, become very, very wonderful and uh, very, very attractive to buy new houses. And it just won't be a problem uh, to sell new houses. Well, and that's interesting. I used to... I mean, I, I would still be available, but I don't think people understand the value of this, um, but it fits in there. But I would go to people's homes that they were trying to sell and do energy work on them, you know, and, and clear the energy so yeah. that, you know, anything that was negative, the house was holding on to would filter off and the houses would sell faster. Yeah. Um, you know, all kinds of miraculous things would happen if there, you know, as I, I like to say, there wasn't bad mojo in the house. Yeah, you, you, were, you were energy sensitive to already knew that. But this is the thing. And we can we can even make it better by, you know, some people have wonderful ideas about sacred geometry. If you use this sacred geometry, the energization, uh, revitalization of these houses will go even faster. Uh, we have lost this, um, this ability of using uh, geometry to make houses more conducive to vital energy. These are these are things like Feng Shui and Vastu uh, uh, in India. These things will come back uh, in a hurry as soon as you pay attention to vital energy technologies and will re revolutionize the uh, housing industry. Cosmetics, uh, perfume, uh, these are, of course, health. I already talked about vitamin C and common cold and devitalized vitamin C. But already, alternative medicine, it's uh, hugely available, but not enough. Not enough to even make a dent in the total medical industry. But if we have integrative medicine, which will use vital energies equally in par with uh, allopathy, with uh, conventional medicine, we have a cheaper better medicine system to help people. Um, and that is, again, a huge portion of the economy. One-sixth of our economy is medicine, of health-related. So uh, I'm talking about real, real, real change in the economic scene that we are envisioning with quantum economics. Well, and one of the things I was having, we were talking about your book this morning over breakfast. And, um, and one of the things that I, that, that passed by me, but, uh, my boyfriend made the comment, um, because I, I was talking about how in your book you were talking about, uh, sustainability and, uh, organic produce and, and different things that he and I, um, have talked about in the past. And, um, you know, and his comment was, that, you know, there's a lot more people leaning in that direction. And my comment back to him, and I would like your take on it, is that, you know, there there are so many people that are in kind of a financial crunch. You know, you work all these hours to make your the money that you can make, but then you have to pay your rent, pay these bills, you know, get your insurance, whatever that is. And so your disposable income to do things like buy food, uh, whatever it is, uh, becomes more limited. And so people out of an economic concern are starting to look at 
having little gardens in their backyard or looking at doing things that are more sustainable. What's your take on that? Yeah, that's part of it. That's part of it, definitely. I mean, this trend of uh, having your own garden, you know, um, there was a comic strip that I like um, uh, in the newspapers. Um, what's the name of it? Um, anyway, they have a little garden that they plant every year. And finally, this year, they get a little traction. Well, some plants, some of their plants are growing. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's very timely to remind people that, okay, you can even grow plants even if you have not succeeded before you can succeed now and and so yes that will be part of the mindset change but remember again um, you know as the worldview changes um, will not have the squeeze of the middle class that gets us into situations where uh, people constantly have to think of how to subsidize subsidize their incomes because middle class is really being squeezed but in the quantum worldview, uh, middle class will start growing again. So um, why should we have our backward uh, backyard garden? Um, not because we are squeezed, because we are uh, you know economically uh, uh, depressed, but because we want to. That's the worldview change. And when we want to, things go much faster. We want to because um, uh, that's the best food we can get because we grow it with love. And look, there's. Uh, Gardening is just so wonderful for developing the feelings of security in you. I mean, the uh, chakra medicine, which quantum physics fully support, um, we say that gardening is one way of getting rooted in your body. And today, people live so far away from their body because they live in the brain, they live in their head. So one of the big challenges is to bring people back to the body, and gardening does that. So uh, things like gardening will be very popular with the new worldview. Um, as soon as people learn, we don't even have to install the new worldview fully. We just have to educate, educate, and educate like we are doing right now. You know, Because what happens is that people don't have security. This is why you have so much fear which uh, adds to insecurity of the root chakra, the chakra connected with our eliminative organs like the anus. So what happens? We, we are always fearful about anything that is new. And these politicians and these economic businesses, they're always taking advantage of our fear-based um, society. Instead, if we are rooted, if energy is plenty, in the root chakra, then what happens is that we, we can attend to our higher needs, which needs are needs of love, open the heart chakra, needs of expression, open the throat chakra, needs of intuition, needs of creativity, open the two chakras of the upper brain, which is the uh, chakra between the eyebrows, brow chakra, and the crown chakra, chakra at the top of the head, which is related to neocortex and mind processing. So, you know, these chakras are not getting any attention right now because all we can do today to bring back our body-centeredness uh, is to watch sex and violence. Yes, they uh, give us a little bit of relief because the um, sexual center and the uh, third chakra, the navel center, gets a little bit of attention from these things that we are constantly using. But that's not very much. Still does not remove the uh, fear, that the fear of you know insecurity that we have, and um, things like gardening, things like uh, uh, I'm talking about economic, uh, bring back love and uh, wholeness in our economic equation. Things like that will give us that. Well, and I feel like when we start getting back into ourselves, back into our body, it will give us the ability to discern better and recognize things that are in the world that are controlling us versus, you know, and not satisfying our needs or not for our highest good and give us the opportunity to make better choices. Yeah. That better choices is the right word. You, you mentioned upward causation versus downward causation before. Downward causation is choice. We have possibilities all the time, especially in advanced economies of the world. People have so many possibilities to fulfill. 
But why do we make wrong choices? Why, when we are hungry at night, why are we making choices of eating hamburgers versus brown rice and uh, veggies? You know, um, these are the questions that people have to people have to deal with, and um, they will deal with better when they realize that they have the choice, and when the social systems help them in that realization. Right now, the social systems are really not helping because it's increasing the um, gap between rich and poor. And you were quite right when you said that people just uh, get so bogged down with their economic problems that um, they are not ready to employ um, their incentive for higher needs as of yet. You know, when you are tired doing a meaningless job during the uh, days to uh, serve your economic needs, all you want to do in the evening is to flop before the TV, mindless stuff. And all you want to do is watch sex and violence because that will at least embody you a little bit, you know, the lower chakras. But uh, this can be changed by changing the current economics to quantum economics. One of the first things to go would be elitism. Elitism is a product of feudal economics. Elitism is a product of when you destroy capitalism. And because you are destroying capitalism, this is why we are getting so much elitism, so much squeeze of the middle class. As the middle class comes back, when middle class becomes creative once again, it will also help to bring into the change in the economy. The whole thing is um, dependent on, on really a lot of synchronous growth between how our mindset changes, which already is changing towards getting more meaningful jobs. Even in the middle of deep recession, really, people did not compromise. Many people held up from taking these low-paying jobs. And, and eventually, um, of course, the economy did start uh, turning back, and, and now meaningful jobs are available, and they are now taking it. So similarly, we have to bring more and more meaningful jobs to people, because that's where the demand is. In Portugal, you know, uh, people are just at, uh, in Spain, sorry. Uh, I just went to Spain, and I was um, kind of pleased, surprised too, that people are just not taking uh, even high-paying uh, meaningless jobs, like plumbing. Instead, they're holding off for a university degree. The unemployment rate is 25%, but still people are not ready to compromise for meaningless jobs. This is a major mind shift. And this mind shift signifies that the movement of consciousness is going to help in terms of deploying quantum economics, because quantum economics changes the equation for labor. It, it squarely says that labor has value. Labor is not machine. The machine-like things, let machines do them. Let the routine jobs, already machines are taking over. You know, robots are coming into the uh, industries in a major way. Routine jobs will be done either by robots or by uh, underdeveloped countries, like outsourcing and all that, which is already prevalent. And that's not going to change. It's going to stay that way. So what the average person has to do in the advanced economy is to hold on to their uh, demand that, yes, I will wait for meaningful jobs, and it is the job of the system, the politicians and the economics and the educational system to create meaningful jobs for me. And that demand is what eventually going to going to be so strong going to change things in a substantial way. And of course, you know, good-minded politicians never has gone away exactly. So even today, it's quite alive, uh, like in Senator Bernie Sanders, who is learning, uh, who, who is uh, running as a Democrat, you know, you, you listen to him and you get a little encouraged uh, that, yes, changes can come. Politicians are talking about changes in a way that is conducive to the movement of consciousness. Of course, um, I don't know if Barney knows about subtle economics, but he can learn. And so I hope people like him get traction in the political system. And, uh, you know, Elizabeth Warren, I already have mentioned. So there is hope for politics as of yet. It's, it's not, 
is not hopeless at all. I think eventually the American um, ingenuity and creativity will come in, will kick in, and will get our country straight. And will again lead the world in terms of not the not what we are doing today, bullying the world about, you know, by the force of arms, but in, instead by the force of love, by the force of heart energy. Do you think that growing economies um, will have a better chance of moving through this energy or focusing their economy on this new energy paradigm? Or do you think they'll have to go through this whole materialistic phase before they can become an advanced nation? Uh, I don't think they have to go through the full materialistic phase. I think it's a, it's a mistake to go through the full materialistic phase simply by the fact that if these uh, developing economies try to do that, the world will simply become unlivable simply become unlivable. Global warming will stop everyone uh, from doing that. So how, uh, how can they or should they um, go to quantum economics without satisfying their full spectrum of material needs? Yes, because the material needs have gone, we have been overblown. We have satisfied our basic material needs 100 years ago. Rest of it really are just inertia. We don't need, as you pointed out earlier, we don't need cell phones and television sets for a very satisfactory, happy life. And I'm not even suggesting. Cell phones actually can be very cheap. In this country, people demand too much, so you know, we use it very expensively. But in India, cell phones are relatively cheap. Even uh, poor people can afford them. Uh, because they are used quite in a different way. Um, uh, so some of this technology, if they are just to the... Uh, medicine is another example. In India, medicines are cheap, but here it's very costly because the pharmaceuticals are very greedy. Um, so it can be done in such a way that the material, basic material needs can be satisfied, and yet much of the abuse of material needs that wastes really uh, produce a lot of waste and also produce a lot of pollution that can be avoided. Um, countries that are not have gone have not gone through the material phase has the advantage that there will be more spirituality in those countries. India is a perfect example, but there are other examples like Brazil, which has never lost touch with their emotional uh, with their emotions in the body. They're pretty body-centered. It's a, such a pleasure for me to teach quantum activism workshops in Brazil because people are naturally emotional. In the West, we are uh, generally in the, in the developed, economically developed West, we are not naturally emotional. Even women are suppressing emotion these days because they have discovered that the way to go up in the corporate ladder is to suppress emotions. This is the wrong trend. The right trend, of course, is to balance head and heart, which is, of course, what quantum economics will do. So coming back to developing countries, um, I think it can be done in such a way that they can get into quantum economics right away. And as the um, subtle energies are available and it is legitimized, uh, people will shift because they have not yet been corrupted by material needs to the extent that people in the West have been corrupted. So, uh, you know, they will be happy to have just a television set and a cell phone, but not get into the excess. The excesses are like people have so many computers in a household. That's an excess. People have so many telephones in the household. That's an excess. This communication, we waste so much money on communication alone today. That's an excess. These excesses, these underdeveloped countries don't need. And there is no need to um, overblow that part through publicity and marketing. Instead, if uh, uh, the entrepreneurs and the investors went right away in vital energy technologies, people will be very happy to get uh, vitality, and then uh, their needs, material needs, will be minimized anyway because they are getting the real thing without going through the phase of material goodies. 
you know, you keep talking about getting back into the heart and accessing the heart. And um, my experience of when you bring your energy into your heart is that your priorities change and you look at the world in a different way, in a more compassionate way. And so is that kind of what you're looking at with this whole concept is each of us becoming more compassionate so that that extends out into business and community and everyone? Yes, and I'm suggesting that quantum economics will do that in an unobtrusive way. This is the beauty of it. As we get into subtle energy economics, you know, this is, this is the part where we do not ignore the advancement of marketing techniques that we have had under scientific materialism. You know, I always like to use everything because everything is a movement of consciousness. What the scientific materialists have done, that is not outside the movement. So you don't have to throw away all their innovative ideas. Marketing techniques have improved. And to the extent that if we make subtle energy popular through marketing techniques quickly, we can do it quickly using these techniques, then what will happen is absolutely wonderful because what will happen is that people will use it, use the vital energy and start being transformed. So what you're suggesting is absolutely true. People will start becoming more and more oriented towards spirituality and wholeness because all they need is an education, slight education in the worldview that these things are really true. All they need is measurement apparatuses that will show them that these things are really real. For example, somebody says, my heart is open. Before, you could not verify. You know, my favorite, uh, my favorite scenario um, is, is, is for imagining that a, that a guy, a young guy, is proposing uh, to a girl. And he says, oh, I love you, darling, and here's the ring. I... Um, I want to marry you. And the girl says, wait, wait. And is she going to be waiting for a long time? Well, I guess we're going to have to wait until we have Dr. Medka Swami back on the show to find out what happens to that young man. It seems like he's been having a little bit of internet problems. But it's time to go. I'm Dr. Ruth Louise. This is Just Energy Radio. Be blessed. Join host Dr. Rita Louise each week at this time for Just Energy Radio. Point your browser to www.justenergyradio.com.